So let's get started then. Um, I've got gotten the recording started, so everyone who is uh, who's listening uh, to this at a, another time, welcome as well. Um, so we're going to cover two topics in today's tutorial. Um, the first one is the EIC software environment. So how and where do you run with the EIC single software stack? Um, and then the other part for the second half of the tutorial is going to be the EIC productivity environment, which is sort of how to interact with other collaborators. Um, what are the places where we store our, our code? What are the code repositories? So let's get started with the EIC software environment. Um, the first things I want to want to highlight is just why do we have a, a standard EIC software environment? Um, it's a little bit an outcome of how we approach software development. We're looking at this as a set of different modular tools. So we are not building one big framework that contains everything. We're building many different tools that all do something um, and they do something small, they do something well. Um, so what that also means is that if we have, you know, right now on the order of maybe 20 to 30 different tools, um, if you want to install it, you would have to sit there and type make install 20 to 30 different times and download and keep track of the versions of each of those 20 to 30 different tools. Um, that's just not a very feasible um, way of, of keeping track of the versions. So what we're providing in the EIC standard environment or EIC shell, as we call it, um, is uh, is a curated environment that uh, already has everything installed with the versions, typically the latest and, and uh, validated versions for you to use. Um, this also allows us to use versions of software that may not be available yet at BNL or at Jefferson Lab or other computing clusters that you're using. Um, it is it is very reasonable for the laboratories to use older versions of software because they are prioritizing stability and, and knowing how something works. Um, in the EIC, we're writing software for, for 10 years from now. Um, so we should not start by depending on things that are 10 years old. Uh, so that's why we're using, for example, later compiler versions so that we can use things that are only available in in C++ 17, 21, or, or C++ 23 um, standards, which are really requiring us to go to, to modern compilers. That's one reason. Um, some of the pr programs that we depend on, upon, for example, ACTS for track reconstruction, or DD4HEP or, or PodIO or other packages that we'll talk about in the tutorial series, not today, um, they are moving fairly quickly in their versioning. Um, so again, you know, sometimes we have a new version coming out, for example, for DD4HEP once every maybe one month or two months. Um, and we want to be able to take advantage of those new versions because in many cases, there's features in there that we've specifically requested for EIC development. Um, so having a standard environment allows us to provide this kind of environment, environment with more recent software um, than is typically available at, uh, at the sites, at the, at the host laboratories or other computing sites, or your laptop. Another benefit is that um, the standard environment gives you access to the environment that is used for full productions, the exact same software versions, gives you a, a access to an env environment that is used for, for our benchmarking of software or of geometries, gives you access to the same environment that's used on GitHub for testing all of our geometry and software, um, and on GitLab servers for all of our uh, more more detailed um, uh, environments, so uh, detailed studies. So you're using the exact same version of software. There's no question about you know having to see differences in in, in different versions between um, what you're doing on, on, in your development and then what, you're, what is happening um, in the, the full simulation production. So that takes away one, one variable of, of often confusion. The standard environments are versioned. They can be retrieved later. So you can say maybe a, a year from now, what was the standard environment that, uh, that production uh, October 2020, uh, 2022 was run in? And you would be able to go back to that standard environment, which becomes a lot more difficult um, if uh, if everyone sort of puts their own uh, their own software components together. 
Um, so for example, that's useful if you want to revisit an old result. It's, it's useful for data analysis preservation. Um, so we can store along with a plot also which software environment was used at that time. And that then includes which Gen 4 version, which root version, um, and everything specific. We could even reconstruct that environment if we really wanted to um, uh, several, uh, several years from now. Um, finally, another big advantage for us as software developers is that we are able to help you better if you use the standard environment. Um, it's much easier if you encounter an issue. Um, if you encounter that issue in a standard environment, we can use that same standard environment to do exactly what you did. And we should see that same issue occur as well. Um, it's the same standard environment that gives us a way to reproduce the issue and that will give us a way of fixing the issue. Um, if, uh, if you compile all of the software dependencies of um, the software that we have, if you compile everything yourself, it is possible that we cannot reproduce the issue um, and then it becomes very difficult to fix that because it's essentially a little bit of a fishing expedition in trying to figure out what might have gone on in something that we can't reproduce. Okay. So those are the reasons why we have a standard environment. Are you required to use this standard environment? No. You can use whatever you want, right? You can, you can decide that this is not the direction you want to go and you're going to compile everything yourself. Um, but we're providing the standard environment to make it easier for you to get started because you don't have to compile all the code yourself, because you don't have to start from scratch and because some of you might not actually be familiar with all of the details of running CMake, auto tools, Mason build systems, not everything's built on CMake, um, SCONs. Uh, so, so if those all sound like, like foreign terms to you, uh, then the standard environment allows you to not have to worry about that. If there is... Um, so in, in the, the software developers group, there's people who don't use the standard environment. Um, but that's because we make that trade off of, you know, yes, in some cases, it makes sense not to do that. Um, in, in my personal case, I use this, this standard DIC shell environment um, probably about 80% of the time. And then for some small things I would use uh, use an, an own compiled version, um, but usually I try to avoid that because I know it's a headache. If you encounter an issue and you've gotten your own setup, then we might ask you to reproduce it in the standard environment because that allows us to then verify that's indeed not an issue with the way you've compiled things, but it's something that occurs also in the standard environment. If you feel like there's something you can't do in this standard environment, then let us know and we'll figure out how to make sure that you can get it done. For example, um, I know uh, this is, is Chris Dilks here. No, um, but, but I see Anselm here. Um, Anselm might want the, the CDIS analysis code to work in the EIC standard environment. Um, you know, I don't want to call out anyone particularly, but I just saw Anselm. So um, this CDIS code could be added to the standard environment so that we are um, clear about which version is being used and, and everyone has easy, easy access to it um, as part of the standard environment. So, so if there is something like that that you want to do, um, I don't want to put Anselm on the spot, but, but that would be something easy to do. Well, yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, but uh, may I have a question? Yeah, yeah sure. Ask uh, so, questions, ask away. So, uh, but in the standard environment, can I access the base classes if I want to print something in the base classes? Let's say if I want to understand something by doing C out or, uh, or printing. Is yeah, you can, you can do development in the base class and in the standard environment, you can change source code. It comes with a compiler, so you can compile everything. Um, it also comes with pre-compiled versions. So of course you cannot change the pre-compiled versions. Um, so that's one of the, um, one of the, the you know, the, in that case, you would have to compile the code in addition to, of course, the version that's already installed, so. Okay, okay, thank you. So it gives the freedom to come this, modify the code also. Yep, exactly. And um, we're not going to get into compiling code in this, in this today's tutorial, but, uh, 
um, that will be part of some of the future tutorial. Okay, so let's get started with command line. Um, I hope you're all set up on a system that has uh, sort of a, a Linux-like environment or a Mac-like terminal environment. Um, so we're going to install um, this EIC standard environment, which we call EIC shell, uh, because that's what the command is like. Um, and um, the first step we're going to do is install this EIC shell um, command. I'm going to do this in a directory, uh, in my home directory. So I'm in my home directory tilde here. I'm going to make the directory EIC, um, and I'm going to put everything in this new empty EIC directory. Um, so you can, of course, put this in whatever directory you want. Um, but for this, uh, for, for reasons of consistency, for the tutorial, I'm going to do this in this EIC um, directory. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a URL, which I'm posting in the chat. Um, and I'm going to download the script that's located at that URL. Uh, I can actually open a, a browser. Actually, I cannot open a browser because I'm just sharing my terminal screen. So I'm not going to do that right now. Um, I will download with a program called curl. I will download from the location this URL. Um, I will download this file. If I don't put anything else there now, it will just download the content of that location and just print it to the screen. It won't do anything. So you can see it's, it's essentially a script that does some stuff. Um, doesn't really matter what it does. Uh, but you can inspect it if you want to. I don't know if Jan Bernauer is here, uh, but he likes to inspect the scripts that he downloads before um, he runs them. So, uh, hello, hello, yeah. Can I question. Uh, mm -hmm. So, is this the same script which was used like, I don't know, half a year ago for Athena? Uh, I did, or is it yeah. changed? Because just because if I need to download a new version of this uh, uh, script, the script changes. The installation script changes uh, over time. Um, All right. If you have already installed the EIC shell before, yeah. it should still work. So um, okay. I, I periodically reinstall this. So, so OK, uh, okay. Um, yeah, that's also good to know. Perfect. But it's Thank the you. same environment. The environment, under, it's the same way to install the environment. Whatever is underneath that's inside the environment, of course, changes. So what we're going to do with this script now that we download is instead of just printing it to the screen, we're actually going to feed it into bash into the shell to run it. Um, and you can see it, it downloads things, it does some, some stuff here, it runs it, and then finally it says, great environment setup successful, and you can access the development environment by running this EIC shell command. Bouter? Yes. No, your bottom line is kind of cut off. Is it now? Um, yeah, okay. it's covered be... essentially by like the chat and participants buttons. Oh, I see. Okay, that's interesting because I don't have. Yeah, I can see his bottom this. line. You can see it. Yes, I can see your prompt right now. Okay, I can see it too. I I think Coley, I just have to move your cursor away so that that thing will disappear. Okay, I'll try that. Um. Yeah. Now I typed that on my Mac. That, and does, that does work. So it doesn't work, Kolya, to get the buttons away? It does work. I think oh, it, it might have been because I had chat or participants list open or something like that. Um, OK. Um, OK, so so I'm, I'm first going to step through some of the, the, the parts here, and then we're going to go into a, an exercise where, where you get to to use this um, approach yourself. Um, if, if you're already following along and you encounter some issues, um, one thing I would say is going to be useful is to, is to post this in the help desk um, channel on Mattermost because it's gonna be, be useful for people to be able to look at the output that you get to compare with, uh, um, with what, what you're supposed to get then and be able to give you detailed feedback on that then. So this is one approach um, is to to just feed this script into uh, um, into bash directly. Um, the other thing you can do is is download oh, okay. this script into 
an actual installation file. Um, so we're going to call that with output document. Um, I'm going to use that same link here. I'm just going to download this. Oh, I should specify a file. No, I don't need to specify a file name. Yeah, I do need to specify a file name. Install.sh. I'm going to save this now as install.sh. Um, and you can look at this install.sh script. And you'll see it's, a, it's the same script, except now you see, see it starting from the top. Um, and that gives you a little bit more freedom if you want to um, specify some options to this install script. So what does this install script, and, and so to run this install script, just to finish Valter? the instructions here. Um, Valter, yeah. Yeah, will you ahead. post the commands which you now have in your shell somewhere? Yes, I will post those. I just didn't get around it. And, uh, sure, I'm just this, asking. Uh, tutorial. Um, it should be done later today. So, so uh, can you can you copy paste wget command? Uh, it's cutting maybe. This one. Yes. Yes. So, what does this install script do? Um, it it does a couple of things. It it figures out which operating system are you on. Are you on a Linux or a Mac? Um, do you have Singularity or Docker installed. Um, those are things that uh, that were in the prerequisites. So um, for for this uh, this tutorial, um, so those are things you need to have installed in advance. Um, it checks whether you have access to the CERN VMFS, CERN CVMFS. Um, that's available on JLab and BNL clusters and essentially all large clusters. Um, which and and that speeds up things a little bit because it doesn't need to download any any environment then, um, and it will install this uh, this EI shell EIC shell script. So so if we run this now with the second approach now of downloading the script specifically, um, it does the same thing again and it installs this EIC shell um, command. And if I look in this directory, which you know was empty before we started, you see that there's now an an EIC shell um, environment, uh, an EIC shell command there. Yeah, I, uh, I have an issue. Shall also with, work with with Sorry. both of the with both of the attempts or the approaches you just listed. Like my it gets stuck on. I think downloading a particular container. Yes. The last line says. Yeah. So it will take a little while to okay. download these containers because they are large. Um, okay. If you do not have this um, this CVMFS directory, so and and I can say you know I have a CVMFS directory which which has singularity open science grid and some other locations here um if you do not have that it has to download the container so that takes a while it's about a i don't know what the size of our container is you know it's a few gigabytes so um if you do have cvmfs then you don't have to do that download um, it is easy to install cvmfs yourself if you wanted to um, I'm going to put the chat, the, the, the link to that in the chat um, that has instructions for even installing CVMFS on a regular um, laptop. Um, if, if you have that installed, you don't need to, um, you don't need to do that download. It will automatically use the, the network link under CVMFS and it will go a lot quicker. The other advantage that you have, if you don't need to download the container, is that it will just be updated automatically because it's just pointing to a, a network location. So that's one way in which you could benefit from CVMFS, um, but it's not required. It just takes a little bit longer to download that container. If you look under, um, well, we're gonna come back to that later. If you do download the container, then of course it means you have to update it periodically. Um, you know, if, if there's a, a, a new version, if there's a there's changes that happen, um, it makes sense to to download a newer version. OK, so in terms of um, a first exercise, I think both of, uh, most of you have probably already looked at that um, and have have worked along. But I'm going to post in the chat a first exercise um, for everyone to uh, to work through. So it's based on uh, on what I, I, I just showed. Um, and I can actually um, show you the commands by sharing, I guess, my, my notes here. 
let me do that. Well, that will be a little bit more difficult maybe to, to fit that next to your screen. So, um, so this is the, the exercise here. And then the commands we just used are here. Um, so you can use the same, um, the same command. So if you have any issues with this, let me know um, or speak up by raising your hand. Um, if you are ready, then let's see. I, um, I have one question. So give I'm me another reaction, a thumbs up, for example. Yep, you have a question? Hello. Yeah, um, actually, the get epic eic.org, um, it says web is blocked for me. I don't know why is that. Um, I don't know in which uh, on which server you might be, but it is possible that uh, that this is blocked by some servers. Um, I, I don't see a reason why, but uh, um, okay, yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, university servers, so that should not be the problem. But I don't know. Yeah, I okay. wonder if you can um, navigate to that same URL on a regular web browser and then just maybe copy and paste the content of that script um, to your terminal window. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, still, it's also um, blocked in the Oak Ridge network. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, what can we do about that in the short term? Um, I post yeah, you can link. try to use the link that Oscar just posted. Um, I, I got it from Nico, to be honest. I did not figure this out. He did. Okay. So certainly it makes sense that Oak Ridge would at least allow Argonne National Lab um, URLs. I don't know if this is going to make a, a difference at, at universities, though, but it would be would be worthwhile to try. But that's, a, that's a, what, really what this uh, get epic eic.org link points to it it just points to the same location that uh, that oscar posted all right thank you So if you've uh, if you've gotten this um, this exercise done, um, or if you're getting to to the end of it, feel free to give a thumbs up, um, so I know how many people are are sort of getting ready with this. If you have a working EIC shell, um, or if you have you've uh, as an advanced user have checked this uh, install scripts um, help function, then uh, um, give me a thumbs up. It's taking time. It takes how much time it will expect to take? It depends on how fast um, your internet connection is. So the, the size of the, the container image, which is really why we encourage you to use CVMFS, the size of the, the container image is, is uh, I think, two or three gigabytes. So, um, so it takes a while to download that, potentially, Mine depending on which location you're on. Yeah, mine just finished 30 seconds ago, but what was deceptive was that there was no status bar. It just hung and then sat there for like five minutes and then just finished. Okay, that, those are all uh, useful bits of information. So there was a status bar for the for the install.py to download. But then after that, when it's downloaded in the container from blah, 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 nightly, singulated nightly, and destination, blah, 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 then it just hangs there. OK. Um, we'll ensure that there's a, a download progress bar uh, for that. Fortunately, um, we're relatively quick on the um, response here. Um, so Jan, I see that you have a, a problem with a, a certificate that has expired. Um, this is this is not actually the. Um, it, it takes a while to explain what the error there is. Um, uh, I would encourage you to um, yeah to try with uh, the insecure flag. This this is an. Uh, I assume you are at the BNL site um, and. Yes. And on some systems there, they have not updated 
some things. Let me just keep it. Okay, up. so I can go with go with the yeah. Okay. If the cluster run doesn't have singularity already, do we need to manually do that or let's auto install it? Um, so you will have to have singularity installed um, on uh, BNL and at uh, Jefferson Lab. What you can do is just do module load singularity. Most other um, DOE large clusters will have a similar um, way of loading singularity. I think even literally module load singularity um, may work on, on most of the clusters. Similarly, if you're on Mac, um, the prerequisite is that you have um, Docker installed. So uh, those are the two prerequisites. Uh, it's, so it's Singularity on Linux-based systems and then Docker on, um, on Mac systems. Yeah, okay, module load work on BNN, all thanks. <laughs> okay, great. So what are the softwares we, uh, we put inside this singularity? Like we event generator, giant, everything we put inside the singularity? Yes, everything is inside of that. Oh, okay. Thank you. So Walter, if I can make a, a one more comment, probably will help some of the people in the audience. So for those of you who have uh, the virtual machine uh, for the fun for all, in that virtual machine, uh, environment this the, the instruction given by Walter will all, also work so if you have a problem downloading the packages through the install.sh uh, you can consider to uh, to just initiate or uh, activate your uh, virtual uh, machine environment for fun for all then logging in and then execute uh, within the virtual machine uh, these uh, commands that will also work. Yeah. yeah, that's that's useful for 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 today. Um, I would hesitate to recommend that for any kind of real work um, because running Singularity inside a virtual machine, you're you're going to be seeing a, a performance degradation because of the layers of of virtualization that are happening there. Then, so I would I would certainly, if if that works today, that that that's good. Um, but I would encourage you to uh, to move towards installing or, or making sure you can access Singularity then directly or Docker directly. Yeah, yeah I completely agree. And for, for those of you who are having issues installing Singularities, you can also uh, put your request in the, in the chat in the Mattermost uh, channel that Walter suggested. So we will then help you guys uh, to install Singularity, please. Please just uh, approach us if you have problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so how is everyone doing on um, installing EIC shell? So if you look in the directory that you're in, you should have an EIC shell command there. Um, so give me a thumbs up if, uh, if, that's, um, if that's there for you. Um, and in that case, uh, we, can, we can move forward. Zoom doesn't have a thumbs down, unfortunately. Uh, if, if you have issues, <laughs> raise your hand. Okay, it seems like we have a lot of uh, thumbs up here. So, um, so excellent. And I assume the, the CFNS thumb is, is representative of a number of different thumbs. Um, so that's good. So let's move on then to the next step. So I'm going to uh, actually keep this uh, keep this up here. Um, so now that we have um, EIC shell, um, so now you can start EIC shell. So in this directory that we've installed EIC shell in, I can start EIC shell by specifying dot slash EIC shell. So it's in this current directory. So um, so it's going to be running from that current directory. Or of course, if I'm somewhere else, let's say I'm back in my home directory, I can just specify the full 
path to EIC shell. I shouldn't have done my reflexive tab complete there. Um, so I can specify the full path to my home directory EIC slash EIC shell. Um, so that will allow me now to start EIC shell. Um, ignore the warnings, which you might not get in your case. Um, that's because I'm running some non-standard system here. I apologize for that. Uh, but you should get a very similar looking prompt, which now starts with jog underscore XL. Um, so that indicates that you're now inside the EIC shell environment. Um, if you wanted to go back out of this EIC shell environment, you just type exit and we're back to um, not having a jog XL um, prompt. So it in indicates that we're back in the original environment. So again, I can go to my EIC directory where I have this EIC shell command installed and I can type EI dot slash EIC shell now from that local directory and I'm back inside the EIC shell environment. There's a couple of different options to this EIC shell command. I'm going to exit again. If I type EIC shell minus minus help, it will show me some options. I can upgrade this to the latest version. This is going to be important if you're downloading the singularity container instead of using CVMFS. Um, so, so that's um, that's going to be something you want to run periodically. Uh, I am using CVMFS, so if I type EIC shell upgrade, it says, no, you can't actually do that because it upgrades automatically if you're using EIC shell. It actually updates every day, multiple times a day by now. This is uh, from, from last year still when it was just once a day. Now I think it's uh, upgrading, updating every six hours. Um, so on um, CVMFS, you have by definition the latest version. Um, again, another reason why we encourage you to use the um, the, the CVMFS install as, as it is uh, used in uh, um, at, at the large computing cluster sites. Now going and typing tilde slash EIC EIC shell every time is going to get old pretty soon. So one thing you can do is ensure that you can type just EIC shell from from wherever you are um, and be able to start EIC shell on a whim. I can go to any directory on my system. I don't know, Oops. I have a data directory. I can start EIC shell from here because I've made sure that it knows where to find that EIC shell. So that's a convenient, um, a convenient way to make sure that you can start EIC shell anywhere. Um, but that requires that you set up your environment in, in the, the computing system that you're using to be able to do that. And that's unfortunately outside of the scope of this tutorial, um, but that's something you can find in uh, um, the, the prerequisites under this um, uh, Unix shell training from the software carpentry. So again, I'm going to post the exercise in the chat here. Um, and so we're going to work through this exercise now. So it's just getting everyone up to speed with starting EIC shell. So run the EIC shell script from that current directory. Make sure that you get this jog underscore Excel prompt um, and then just exit. Look at those help options. Um, see if, uh, um, if this, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend running the upgrade option right away after having downloaded the previous version because it's just going to download um, the same uh, three gigabyte file again. So, so that's probably not a very efficient use of your bandwidth. Um, and then if you are um, interested in that, try to see if you can set up your environment on your local computer to, uh, to run EIC shell from anywhere. I run this upgrade command after you paste again. So I guess again it started. So we can terminate or something. You can. I um. <laughs> that's a good can... question. I wonder if you terminate it, whether you end up with half a container because it just will be. I would let it complete again. Sorry. 
I, I did it and it, it just said it's up to date. It took it two seconds. Oh, excellent. Okay. So sometimes <laughs> I don't even know how smart our tools are. So, and so that's perfect. And then, uh, then you can just interrupt it. What is the link to the uh, the prerequisite list in the shop for carpentry? I... Um, so is that on Mattermost or? Um, that was sent around with uh, announcements. Um, I don't have this link um, right here with me, okay. but um, I am going to go out on a limb here and think it's carpentries.org slash um, shell novice or something, um, but I'm not 100% sure. So it's not a EIC or EPIC specific no, it's it's a general uh, training. Uh, okay, so that's not the right link. Um, that's a uh, so so as as you may know, um, the the HEP Software Foundation has a training working group, which I happen to be a convener of, um, and we're providing um, trainings to high energy physics um, and nuclear physics communities, and those are general trainings in just Unix shell, um, Git, introductory Python. Um, C++ and so on. Uh, so, so there's no reason why in, in some sense um, in EIC we have to offer those trainings individually um, when they're already available from other organizations. And, and the HEP Software Foundation uses these Carpentries organization um, trainings as a basis. So, so that's why we're pointing to those. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm um, just checking in. Can everyone who has successfully started EIC Shell uh, give a, a thumbs up? Okay, very good. I see lots of thumbs and uh, and and more appearing. Um, so let's move on to the to the next step. Um, so now we're going to look at what's inside this EIC Shell environment. So, um, so first of all, what is EIC shell? It's a, it's a container. Um, we've talked about Docker and Singularity. I've not really talked about what specifically those are, but they're programs that allow us to, um, uh, to start containers. Containers are like uh, self-contained operating systems that still use a lot of the functionality of the host operating system. So it's a little bit different than a, a virtual machine, which really, takes over the, the, the virtualization completely and you can run Linux on a Windows system. Um, but a container allows you to run an operating system of the same type. So you can run a Linux system on a Linux system or you can run a Linux system on a Mac system with a little bit more effort. Um, but you cannot run a Linux container on a Windows system. Um, so that makes them a little bit more suited for high performance applications because it doesn't have to um, pretend to the operating system that it is complete, something completely different. So what we're doing here is, is uh, putting a thin layer of an operating system on top of the host operating system. If you look inside EIC shell um, and you look at, for example, the top level directory slash, um, then You'll see that this looks very much like the directories you would find in a regular Linux operating system. Um, what you're looking at here are, however, the directories inside the container. They're not the directories of the host operating system. Um, a few directories that you see inside the container are the directories from outside the container. One of them you'll probably have realized is the current directory. Okay, there's a lot of stuff in my home directory, so let me go to that EIC directory. Um, so the current directories 
um, my home directories, those are all shared between the container and the host operating system. That means that if I create a file or a directory or do anything within the container, it's immediately available to outside the container. Again, in contrast to a virtual machine, where if you close the virtual machine, you might lose all of the things that were inside that virtual machine, again, unless you do specific things. For containers, um, it's much easier to, uh, to sort of share um, files inside the container with files outside the container. Inside the container, there's another important directory, um, which is user local. Um, again, if you're familiar with some, uh, some, some Linux operating systems, um, then uh, it's, uh, you know that this is a directory where we would install our own software. Um, so, so that's what we do here. We install the software for EIC in this user um, local directory. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing that, John, if you do LS within this EIC shell that you see your home directory and not the directory you started in, um, I think that may be um, that, that, uh, that is possible, um, but you should be able to just navigate to the directory you started in again. Um, in very rare cases, it is possible that the logic that we use does not capture the original directory. Um, we're trying to avoid that, but sometimes in particular on, on HPC systems that use Luster and that provide the Luster directories at a different location than where their original mount point is, um, that may not work. So again, if you're in that situation, um, please please post it in the help desk on our Mattermost and we can provide the, um, the information, first of all, on how to fix it in the short term, um, but in particular, it will help us in, in making sure that it doesn't happen in the future by, uh, by building in a check for that in, um, in, in EIC shell itself. So back to our user local directory here. So you can see there's stuff in here. There's, uh, you know, references to parts that you might be familiar with. There's, there's you know, a reference to Juggler here, which people from uh, um, Athena or Epic will, will remember. Um, there's, there's references to the DD detectors, which refers to DD for help. So this is where stuff stuff lives that is um, from, uh, from inside the EIC software environment. Okay, we have a question. Uh, yes. So when we are in this juggle Excel environment, we should all see this at LS? You should see this if you go to this user local directory and then run LS there. You have to put the slash in front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that. But but there should also be. Oh, never mind. Uh, I was looking at two different things. Thank you. Yeah. So so this is going to be different from what is on your own computers on the host systems user local. So so that will look different. Uh, uh, whatever is in the host systems user local directory will be will be over overridden in some sense by what's in the container. That's why the container is useful. Um, so one of the benefits of, uh, of using user local is that automatically everything that's in bin, user local bin um, will be executable. Um, so we can do things like run, run programs inside um, this, uh, uh, we can run programs that are installed in the user local directly from inside the container. And that's of course the big benefit. So one example here will be the coma, command DD sim which is the dd for hep simulation tool or one dd for hep simulation tool. Um, so that's installed in this container under user local. And we can run, for example, dd sim help. And it will you know, prevent, print out some help, which unfortunately gets a little bit jumbled in the formatting here because of the, the font size that I have. Um, it's not as important what it's printing now. The important part is it finds this dd sim command inside the container. Um, and it's installed in the container. You don't need to worry about installing dd for help. For um, the more advanced users, um, uh, well, let's, let's, uh, let's make that part of the exercise to explore where things are in this container um, in, in a little bit. So um, one of the things one of the other important directories besides 
this user local directory is the slash opt directory. If you look in the slash opt directory, there's also information or files stored there. This is where detector descriptions are stored for EIC. Um, this is where this is where um, some of our support for uh, large production campaigns is stored. This is where benchmark systems, um, detector physics, reconstruction benchmarks are stored. Um, this is also where our software is stored, not in the jumble that's under user local, um, but in a little bit more of an organized fashion. So this is software that is built for Linux, Debian systems, um, in particular, oh, I need to go to software, Linux Debian systems. It's built for GCC 12. Um, so if I do GCC minus minus version, by the way, inside this container, you'll see that this is um, a, a version 12.2 um, of, uh, of the GCC compiler. And in this GCC compiler, you see all of the pieces of software that are compiled um, or are included in this uh, EIC container, um, in EIC shell. Um, another way to get access to that is to type EIC info. That will show you all of the versions of every piece of software that's included in the container. Um, so EIC info will show us all that. And you can see there's some components here about the epic geometry, which, um, which GitHub commit tag was included. There's still some Athena software in here, some Etches software in there because some people are still running comparisons with the old uh, old geometries as well. Um, if I wanted to know, for example, which version of a particular tool is included in here, I would use, for example, EIC info. And let's say we want to know what version of Jan 4 is included. I would grep in the output of EIC info for the word Jan 4. And that would show us that you know, again, the alignment is a little bit off here, and it gives us some things about ACTS because the word JN4 appears there too. But this is including JN4 version 11.02. Um, um, so, so that's one of the the things we can uh, we can get out of this uh, this this um, uh, this command to be able to figure out what is included in the container. So I'm going to put the next exercise. Oops, the next exercise in the chat here as well um, so so check that you can navigate around in that container figure out that you can indeed access the directories where you store your own work um, and then look at uh, you know for example this dd sim command see that you can run that maybe figure out if there's another command that you might uh, be interested in running inside the container root is installed inside the container so so that might be another one that you can test for um, and then see um, if you're if you're done with that as a, an advanced exercise see where that dd sim is actually located if you run which dd sim um, which dd sim are you using and, and that verify that that's actually pointing to this opt software link um, so uh, so that user local is really just a view into um, the, the software and then you can also access some of these other parts that are described in the um, in this last paragraph here so i'll give you some time to do that and let me know if you have any questions and after that we're actually going to go into a five minute break or so Walter, uh, a question. So, for example, if I do root, then uh, my my bad habit is to immediately check if the T browser functionality will work. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't, right, in this particular. Uh, yes, it will. So if I do root, and my bad habit is to always add minus L, so the the splash screen doesn't pop up. Um, so yes, yeah, so if you start root, it will uh, it will have support for uh, the T browser. One of the things you see in my case now, it takes a little while before it starts root. Um, so the advantage of CVMFS is that it doesn't download up front, but whenever you start a large new program, it will download specifically the parts it needs then. So the first time running root, the first time running um, JN4, especially if you're using a, a large data set, when you're using CVMFS, it will run a little bit more slowly. Um, but after that, it, it CVMFS caches all of that uh, stuff 
in uh, on, on your system and so you don't have to download it again so if i start a new t browser oh, here, I, when i tried to oh new t browser because when i just typed t browser and then gave it a name it, it said can't run it in batch mode um can't run it in batch mode this this is on a mac with docker yes okay so now i just i type instead i type t browser and then it says oh no no it's it it okay it gave me an address but it also says it says the root browser cannot run in batch mode so it's possible that um that on a mac you need to have this this uh, what is it called x quartz installed is that possible oh that's possible i thought i had that installed but um because i run that's that does sound vaguely familiar i am uh, i am not as familiar with Macs as i wish i was because i would be more familiar if i had one um well i think they're gonna go away so <laughs> <laughs> Also for me ah, on, you know on what? you know what? Oh no, there I have X quartz. Yeah, you'll need X quartz if you're reading like on like a farm or something. I do have X quartz. Do I need to have it on? May I ask? I think on Mac. Uh, yes. Uh, but uh, oh, I, I see. Okay. Um, Export yes. starts a terminal. Do I have to then run all of this from inside the exports terminal? Yeah. So uh, Walter, so on the Linux Linux system, I posted uh, this. What this is what I get, and it doesn't quite work. Uh, yeah. So other people have the same thing here. So so I see, um, Bill. I, I see your error message, um, uh, and and I see what Jan and and uh, D H E V A N are, are getting. Um, that's yeah thanks that that's useful information um so i would encourage you to run with this minus minus web is off um uh, functionality so a recent change in root uh, and we're running with a relatively recent version of root here 6.26 um, is that now by default the root browser opens a web browser it doesn't open um a, a graphics window and um especially when you're running this on um, on some systems, you cannot open um, a web browser from inside the container because we're not really shipping a web browser as part of the container. Um, so so try opening root with this minus minus web is off, um, and we'll actually make sure that uh, does this that this gets disabled so that by default it doesn't try to do that. So uh, thanks for letting us know. What is it? Minus minus. Can you type it in there? Yeah. So it will be. Let me see. In the, it is in the chat. Yeah, Bill already yeah. pasted it for you guys. So you would do something like this: minus minus web is off. And it's also in suggested in the error message, actually. Yeah. And it works for me fine with this option. Yeah. Yeah, now it works for me. Thanks. That's useful to know, and that uh, is something we can fix by <laughs> tomorrow's session. So, uh, Walter, I have one thing to ask. Uh, where the, you find the geometry for the H you shown in the tutorial? I missed that. Um, so I haven't, uh, I haven't actually talked about that yet. So let me stop starting the T browser here. Um, so I haven't actually shown yet where the um, the 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 T browser is, uh, where, where the geometry is located. Um, but that's actually under this opt directory um, and there's a detector directory and in here you'll see epic nightly um, which contains the the nightly built of uh, um, uh, which which is the nightly built of uh, of the epic geometry okay thank you so, where so is the if you look in that directory epic nightly um, you'll see it has this setup script, um, and this is something we'll talk about more in the next uh, tutorial, which is going to be next week when we're talking specifically about dd 4 hab geometry. Um, so to use this geometry, this epic nightly geometry, which was the geometry right now, you would source this setup script 
Um, and that will now, you'll see there's there's two things that happen here. I'm, I'm sort of uh, improvising here a little bit, um, but it will have loaded the, the epic nightly geometry, the current master branch on the epic repository, which we'll come back to in a, after the break. And it changes the prompt to indicate that you're running the nightly version. Um, Right now, you're just going to see nightly there every time. Um, it just means that if you have nightly, it means that the geometry is loaded. Um, in um, For those of you who are familiar from the, the Athena uh, repository days, at some point when there's versions, when, for example, we have Epic version 1.0, um, then this actually is turned into Epic dash. 1.0 or whatever we name the version of our uh, our detectors so this gives a, you an immediate visual indication of which geometry is currently um, active and loaded um, for for simulations that you might be running or for reconstruction that you might be running uh, where the root this, this is not a root file where is the root file what do you mean with a root file there's no there's no root file for the, the geometry. So the geometry is defined, again, as, as will be shown next week, um, the geometry is defined in, in XML files and, um, and libraries. It's not based on a root file. Previously, we are converting the XML file into a geometry.root that we open with the web browser or something like this. Um, you could still uh, convert this geometry to a root file. Um, that's that's one way to visualize them, but they're not um, they're not stored as root files inside the container. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think next week at the tutorial you'll see some of this uh, these exports. So, for example, if you do DD Web Display export, um, it will export into a root file. So, so that would be one way to use that. Of course, if I do that in this directory, I can't write a root file into the the read-only directory inside the container, so I'd have to do that in um, in a different directory. Okay, um, so let me see. Um, we can take a a two-minute break or so, or a five-minute break if people are uh, are interested in uh, in in uh, um, a biological break. And then we uh, we can pick up again. And if you have questions, you can ask them now. So let's start again with the next half at uh, at three forty. Yeah, I think. Oh. And I'm gonna pause the recording here. Okay, so we're back for the second half now. Um, and so at this point, we're actually gonna talk a little bit more about the productivity environment. Um, so in addition to the EIC shell environment, which allows you to take advantage of the versions that are installed um, in terms of, you know, having all access to all of DD4HEP, having access to all of root, um, Gen4 and so on, exactly the versions that are used for full productions, um, including things that you might not otherwise want to install like Pod.io and, and some other things that Pod.io relies upon, words that you'll hear about more in the next while. So in addition to that, we have um, the, the GitHub environment that, some, that may be relatively new to some of you. I'm gonna see if I can blow this up a little bit so it's ambiguous um, for everyone. So, um, so all of our repositories for code, for example, the geometry, the reconstruction code, these benchmarks, they're located in Git repositories. Um, primarily on uh, github.com. Um, so if you go to, unfortunately, the address bar doesn't increase in size when you zoom in on a browser. Um, but if you go to github.com slash EIC, um, you'll see the front page of our um, EIC, uh, or, or EIC um, organization on GitHub. So, uh, so that's one place where we store um, repositories. There's another location which um, some of you may be familiar with, but which we're moving away from. And that is, I'm just gonna show that for literally um, a, a few seconds only, uh, but that is our um, EIC web server at Argonne National Lab. Uh, so this is uh, something that some of you may be familiar with as well. 
Um, I'm going to close this because I'm not going to spend any more time on it. It is very um, limited to just continuous integration, and it's not a tool that most of you will need to be interacting with um, in going forward. So GitHub is the main source code repository system that we're using. Um, so that's the one we're going to be we're going to be focusing on. Um, if you go to the GitHub page, uh, you can become a member of this GitHub EIC organization. Um, if you are not a member, then this this won't be what you see. If you're not a member, then it actually will look more like this, with information on how to join and how to essentially become a member. So if you are not a member already, please, um, first of all, ensure that you have a GitHub account, um, but please send us um, either to the, the software working group conveners um, or just in the Mattermost channel right now, probably not in the chat because it's just gonna scroll too fast maybe, um, but send us your GitHub username or email address, and then we can add you as a member to the EIC organization on GitHub. That will give you um, easier access to some of the resources that we're using there. So please feel free to post that in the Mattermost channel, um, or, or if you don't want to send that publicly in the, the help desk channel, you can also just send it to me directly. Okay, um, right, and now I'm going to see messages from everyone. Um, Where do you get this uh, member, uh, this peer in this? Uh, say again? Uh, we had to get this particular information, how to join. Where is it? Like that. So, so you just need to send your, um, your username, your GitHub username to, uh, um, to one of the, the conveners of the software working group or post it in the Mattermost channel and then uh, we will add you. So it's, it's a, a process that unfortunately you can't request membership it is one of those uh, things that we have to initiate that for you. No, we had this readme.md. I didn't find that. So that's on uh, on the link that, uh, who was it? Uh, Nicholas posted in the, in the chat. So just the github.com slash EIC page. If it looks like this, if there's a table with the working groups and the meeting times and indicos and so on, um, then you're already a member. If it doesn't look like this, and if it says how to join, then you're not a member, and then you need to become a member. So um, one of the things you'll see, regardless of whether you're a member or not, is a list of repositories. Um, so you'll see, um, in, if, if, you're, if you're not a member, you'll actually see uh, four of them that are pinned to the top. Uh, but if you are a member, you'll just see this list of ranked repositories that are ranked by the latest activity. So three hours ago, EIC reconstruction, JANA based had some activity. Um, see this EIC, you can sort of see the, the, the table, the timeline of, of activity, also recent activity. EPIC, that's the geometry description for EPIC. Um, DRIDGE development, EIC SPAC packages, which go into building the container, um, the data model, and so on and so on. These are repositories that are um, interesting to keep an eye on. So um, one of the things you can do, and I'm gonna go to this Epic repository. So I'm gonna click on this Epic repository, is you can subscribe to some of the activity in, this, uh, in these repositories. So you can see that here under watch, or in my case, it says unwatch because I'm already watching this repository. You can watch this repository and get notified when there's important changes. Um, so one of the things you might want to do for some of the repositories that you're interested in is um, watch those repositories. Um, so that's one thing that you can um, you can do, uh, and you can again make this a little bit more fine grained if you uh, if you want to be notified, for example, only of issues or pull requests. Um, and then uh, then change that to to be notified of only those things. Uh, other things you can do is start a repository, um, which really doesn't help anyone other than uh, give the developers a, a little you know badge of approval by uh, by having lots of stars on the Epic repository. Um, so as an exercise now, um, I want everyone to make sure that you know whether you are um, a a member of the GitHub organization. 
and then also check which teams you are in. So I'm going to go back to this EIC organization. I'm going to click here on teams. Um, and this, you'll see a lot of list, a, a lot of teams listed here, including ones that you're not actually in and, and probably don't even need to be in. But if you click on members and you show, you click on my teams, you'll see which teams you are currently in. One of the teams that will be useful to join is Epic Devs. So those are um, the, the, the developers in the Epic collaboration. Um, and so it will be useful for you to request. This is one of the, the times where you can actually request to be um, to become a member of the, the a team. So, uh, so this will be one of the places where you'll want to request membership of the, the Epic Devs team. So check whether you're currently in there and if not request um, access and then choose one repository to subscribe to with some level of activity. Um, if you're mainly interested in geometry development, you might want to pick the, the Epic repository. If you're mainly interested in the far forward or far backward regions, you might want to pick the IP6 repository because that's where most of that activity happens. If you're mainly interested in um, reconstruction algorithms, then this EIC recon um, a repository is, is important. Um, and there's there's some others, uh, you know, if, if you don't find a repository that's important, that, that's um, immediately jumping out at you, that would be corresponding with your work, um, feel free to speak up and uh, I can direct you to which which organization, which repository that would be. If it's cities, for example, I want a, a shout out for the cities repository. So then you would go to uh, to cities uh, EIC. So in my case, when I am trying to contact uh, this uh, for the join, it is showing something strange. It is opening some browser to write email. Is it something? Yeah. So so if uh, so, you're not a member then, I imagine. So if we go back to the the EIC user group and oh yeah so you're clicking on on this link yes yes so that's a link that will send an email to the the EIC user group software working group conveners so in that email just write your uh, github username and and say that you want to become a member of the the github um, EIC organization and then uh, that will be acted upon by uh, um, by the conveners but this is not some official email. I think it's something different. Uh, when I, uh, I think that's probably on how depends on how you have your browser set up. Yes, yes. Something. So you may yes. have to then just right click and do copy email address and then copy it into ah. your regular email browser or email email browser that doesn't exist. Okay. Um, email client. Yes, yes, it will work. Thank you. So where is the link for uh, to uh, join a particular uh, repository? Or to be updated so so if you go back to um you know you can also go to all of the repositories so so if you wanted to i don't know which repository would we be talking about maybe see the cic um so you would go to this stop button here that should show i guess no i don't want to ignore um how do i turn this uh so somehow here it should say watch I don't think I can get it to say watch again without saying it, having it say something else, but it should say watch. And if you click that, you will watch that repository and get notified of, uh, um, of activity in that repository. Okay. So I'm glad to see already in the, the CDIS EIC repository, we have uh, 15, 14 people who are watching this. And let's see on the EPIC repository, we've got 18 people who are watching this repository. If you find that you're getting too much email, which won't blame you, um, you can of course fine tune this uh, later on. So, uh, so I would encourage you to keep that in mind um, rather than being swamped by emails or notifications in it. Uh, Lov, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, can you please tell me the uh, a team for forward and backward reasons again? Uh, that's the IP6 repository. So it's uh, EIC slash IP6. 
So there's a there's historical reasons why those are separate, and there's also technical reasons why the historical reasons are winning out. Um, okay, uh, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thumbs up if you're good. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So then let's move on to the next step, which is, uh, is going to be um, essentially how do we interact with these repositories. So one of the things that the repositories allow us to do, in, in particular on GitHub, is to work collaboratively. One thing about working collaboratively is don't step on each other's toes, you know, by, by doing work that other people are not going to like you did, um, and make sure that other people know what work you're working on so that they don't start doing the same thing. Um, so, so how do we achieve that? Um, the common approach in doing this on GitHub is in a, a two-step um, workflow. It is a workflow that first identifies the, the problem that you want to solve with the work that you want to do by creating an issue for it. Now let me go to actually IP to uh, the Epic repository where there's some open issues. So there's some some issues that have been reported. I'm gonna, for example, pick. Uh, I don't know is Matt on the on the call. He's not. Um, but I'm gonna pick Matt Posick's, um issue where there's something he identified that needs to change, and he puts it in the in an issue and identifies. You know, this is the things that need to be done. Um, at this point, Matt has assigned himself to this. So it's clear that he will want to work on this and feels responsible for, for doing this work. That identifies to other people that um, if you start doing this work, you're going to be stepping on Matt's toes. Um, whether, whether he's going to be um, upset by that or not, that, that's irrelevant, but at least there will be duplicate work being done, which we want to avoid. Now this only works if people are reporting what they, plan to work on as part of an issue and, and sort of participate in this in this process of, of collaborative work. So I said there's two steps. The first step is of course reporting when you're when when you think something needs to be done and you want to start working on it. The next step is to um, actually start doing the work and and um, creating the um, from this issue that's reported a pull request. So that is something that you'll see has happened here already as well, because there's a, a pull request that is associated with this issue. That's where Matt has started doing the work and where he's proposing to merge this into the epic um, geometry. So again, you know, this is, as you can see, this is fairly recent. This was just six hours ago. Um, or at least the last edits were done six hours ago. Um, so what is Matt describing here? He's describing what he did, how he did it, why, it, why he did it, um, whether there's any kind of other impacts it will have on other parts of the code, um, whether there's a, you know, there's, there's still a, oops, let me not move this around, but there's a to-do list here. There's still three items that are outstanding. Um, will this change any default behavior? Will this break it? anything for anyone? No. Um, so this is giving everyone insight into what Matt is doing. And so it allows people to prepare for it. Um, it allows the issue allows people to see who is working on what and what are the things we think need to be changed. The pull request allows people to see, you know, which direction is this going into. Um, we can look at, you know, I don't want to have everyone look here at Matt's Matt's code and all that, but um, but everyone could and you can sort of see which files this is affecting. Um, it introduces a new material, for example, which might be something that some other um, groups might be interested in using as well, if you're also using um, argon uh, CO2 mixtures of the same type. So there's this two-step process of an issue and a pull request. Um, one thing you'll see as well in the pull request, if I scroll down a little bit, 
on every pull request, we run a long list of checks to make sure there's no overlaps, to make sure it doesn't change our tracking resolution, to make sure it doesn't um, change the it doesn't change the, the the resolution in reconstruction of X and Q square for DS events at the variety of different energies that we are going to do collisions at. So we really run a lot of um, checks on this to make sure that whatever you're proposing to change doesn't affect the physics of the uh, of the um, of the uh, experiment in a negative way. And that's, of course, something we have to do, because if we have so many people working together, um, we don't want there to be some surprises, because as soon as I click or as someone clicks this merge button, um, this this all goes into EIC shell and it will be rolled out to everyone um, less than a day later. So we want to make sure that if something goes into EIC shell, it's actually working, which means that we want to make sure it works before we merge it into the, um, the EPIC repository. So we're going to do a little exercise on this now. Um, so I want everyone, you know, you've identified in the previous step uh, a repository that you're watching. So that's probably one that you're interested in. Um, and you're probably thinking of something that that repository or that project needs to do. There's there's some issue that um, needs to be worked on. Uh, maybe it's something you're already working on for which there's not an issue already. So think of one of those issues and go through the process of submitting that issue. So I'm going to show you how that works here in the case of Epic. Um, there's a button here, new issue. I'm going to click the new issue button. It's going to ask me, uh, you know, what is it? Is it actually a report of something that doesn't work that I want to report this as being a, a bug? Or is it a new feature that I want to add? Um, let's say in most cases today, probably it's going to be a new feature. So I'm going to click on get started here. And it's going to give me a couple of prompts. I'm going to want to pick a good title that summarizes well what it is that I want um, this issue to describe and then is this related to a problem what's the solution that i'd like to see what other alternatives might there be to achieving the same solution to the problem and is there any additional context or so that might be relevant so i'm not going to type anything in here i'm going to give you all um, a little bit of time to think of one of those issues think of a good title fill out the prompts here and try to make it you know realistic about something that you actually think should be addressed in the simulation it's okay if it's already done um uh, it it's uh, it, it, a perfectly valid issue is one where we then say well this actually already already exists but think of something that is important to you and that you want done and then after you submit this issue tag someone who you think um, would want to comment on this so you'll see I'm going to go to Matt's issue um, and I'm going to see I'm going to go down here and I'm going to see show you how to comment on this I can do at Matt Posix good job Matt um, now wait, wait, let me not be creepy um yeah that's it. I'm just going to tag him with something with nothing. Um, and he's going to be confused about why that appears. But whatever, someone tell him later. Um, so you could tag someone there whose GitHub username, you know, um, and, uh, and, and that you want to comment on the issue that you post. So again, I'm going to copy and paste the instructions here. They're in the comments. So think of an issue, pick a good title open that issue in the repository um, and then tag one person and and yeah the instructions are do not tag me i don't want 38 issues to be in my inbox may i ask one thing where is mm -hmm. the fund for all repository here which is updated um, the fund for all repository. This is this is not part of the single software stack. So so fund for all is not. Um, I, there there is a repository under EIC um, that has fund for all in it. 
So if you go to find repositories and you type fund for all, um, you'll see all of the fund for all repositories here. Um, but those are, are relatively static now that we're moving to a different um, software framework. So you'll see these are June 15th and, and, and older with only um, a few minor changes. You know, you can sort of see the activity leveling off here as, as we move to the, the new software stack. Thank you. I'm going to pick Bill here as a, as an example. Okay, Bill. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I'm sorry, my dogs are getting antsy. So you might see some repositories are using slightly different templates for uh, issue reports or or, or, or feature requests. Um, that's essentially something that's up to the repository to to decide. Um, and in some cases, like for an analysis code, it's 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 different than um, if you were to uh, um, to to write a, a comment on a, on a geometry repo repository. So there's some freedom there. So there is going to be a next step where we are going to create a pull request from this issue. So I want everyone to make sure they have a, an issue submitted so we can move on to that next step. Um, and then we're going to bring it all back together by taking that pull request and, and opening it in um, EIC shell. So.
and I'm going to use Bill's request for a, a pre-shower description on the B0 magnet um, as, as an example for that. So just with a thumbs up, um, who has already submitted the issue and tagged someone that they would like to, uh, to comment on that issue or, or give some input on? Holy Bill. Uh, Alex, I assume you submitted something in IP6. Yep. So you don't have to have a, an account. Um, you don't have to be a member of the EIC organization to submit issues. So you can definitely create an issue there. Um, the next step will look a little bit different, but uh, but I'll go over that. So. So, so Jan, if you want, you can certainly submit an issue. Okay, thank you. And if you subscribe to those repositories, you'll see emails come in as I just saw Alex's email come in and there's another one. <laughs> Okay, so um, so let's let's move on here. Um, I will show you what the next steps are in um, uh, in turning this now into a pull request. So let's imagine I'm Bill for a second, um, and we've just submitted a pull request here. Um, there, there's there's not a, a lot of, of information here yet, but Bill can certainly go in and edit this later um, to add more information about what. What is required? Okay, let me add. Let me let Bill um, add that information while I go let the dogs out. Just a second. I'll be back in two minutes. Okay. Et voila. Let's see how long that lasts. Um, so what we're going to do now is uh, in this pull request, uh, let's say I'm the one who is going to be implementing this, I'm going to go to the sidebar here and you need to be 
um, a uh, um, you need to be a member of the, the EIC organization for that. And I'm going to turn this, this issue into a branch. I'm going to create a branch. Uh, by default, it's going to give it some name that is um, inspired by the title of the repository. Um, I can even choose to put this in a different repository, but in this case, I'm just going to, um, I'm actually going to choose to put this in a different repository because the pre-shower is actually going to be in the IP6 repository. So I'm going to put this in EIC IP6. So I'm going to create a new branch and a pull request from that, um, that issue. I encourage you to do that as well, because we're going to come back to that in a, in a second. So create branch. And it's giving me some information on how to interact with this. I'm just going to remember that this is the the name of that branch, 91, adding the improved pre-shower for B0. Um, we're going to use the commands later, um, but, uh, but we're going to come up with them ourselves then. So now I'm going to navigate to this IP6 repository. And I'll see that this branch should have been created here. So if I click on master here, which is where the branch are, branches are listed. I'll see 91 adding the improved pre-shower for B0. So I can click on that now. Hey. Um, I can look at what's in this branch. Of course, there's nothing yet in this branch. There's no differences. I haven't made any changes, but I can turn it into a pull request as soon as I make some changes. So we're going to make some changes next and do that then. Um, Kong? So in order to create a branch, uh, you need to be a member, right? You do need to be a member, yes. I think if you are not a member, it will allow you to create a branch, but it will be in a forked repository, which will have some, uh, some implications later on. Uh, we can fork also, and then we can make the pull request. Is it uh, the same thing? Yes, but if you do fork and then create a pull request, the, the, the difficulty then is that it won't run all of those checks on the code. Oh, okay. So that's why that's the main reason why we want you to become an EIC organization member, because that allows us essentially, um, mm. essentially allows us to trust you in running code on the, the computing systems that we use for um, for those checks. Okay, so now we have this new branch with uh, the changes that, um, um, that or where, where we want to do the work for um, implementing this uh, um, this this pre shower in the in the B zero. Um, so now we're going to go back to um, the EIC shell environment, and we're actually going to do that work. I mean, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do the work. I'm just going to show you how you would go about doing this work. So let's go back to EIC shell. Let's make sure this is clear. Um, and I'm going to start as if there's no, nothing yet. So just from my EIC directory, um, where's nothing in there yet. Hey, come on, guys. Um, so I'm in this directory. I'm going to start EIC shell. Again, I'm in EIC shell. And now I'm going to take this repository and I'm going to um, I'm going to use HTTPS. That's probably what most of you are using. I'm going to um, clone the contents of that repository inside this directory in EIC shell. So git clone and the repository. So I'm cloning this repository and get this installed in EIC shell. You could do this outside of EIC shell as well. Um, there's not really any difference there. Uh, it's it's uh, should be cloning into IP6. I don't know why it's not doing it. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, right. So this is actually one of those delays that comes from the CVMFS um, running because first had to essentially download the entire git command before it could start downloading it. So that's why it seemed like it was hanging a little bit there. So that's now in my IP6 directory. I'm going to go into my IP6 directory. Um, I am on the, 
the master branch. So I want to change to this branch that we just created to do the work on the B0. So I'm going to do git. Let me see if I can. Uh, uh, there we go. Hide this, this bar there. OK. Um, so I'm going to change to the, um, to the branch that we're interested in, git checkout to get branch, what is it? Uh, I'm going to copy and paste the name of this branch. Where is it here? Just going to copy and paste it from the address bar here. There we go. So now we're on the branch 91, adding the improved pre-shower for B0. Um, again, there's no changes yet in this, this repository. Um, but I can start working on this branch. I can actually start um, compiling this code. It's it's code that uses DD for HEP, but because I'm in EIC shell, I can use uh, I can use um, the DD for HEP. Um, it's code that will use CMake, but CMake is installed in in uh, um, in EIC shell. Um, it uses a, a C compiler or C++ compiler, but that's also available in EIC shell. So just um, I'm just going to type the, the standard built instructions for most of our pro, um, most of our projects. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter that you understand right now what, what this all does, because that's going to be the topic of next week's um, tutorial. But the important thing is, is you'll see that this will start to do things like compiling code or configuring code um, completely inside EIC shell against the code that has been downloaded um, from this branch that we just created, which allows you to start to do work towards solving the issue that you've identified. Um, I'm going to do one more thing, and that's just making a minor change into the repository, and then push that back to the um, to uh, to GitHub, and then create the pull request from it. So then you'll see that process as well. Um, so let's see. So and um, IP6, this is where does the B0 live? Far forward, B0, pre-shower. I don't know, maybe this is already done. Bill, you might, you might be lucky, the pre-shower might already be implemented. Um, so I'm just gonna do this. I'm gonna add info field, author is, um, and I'm gonna put, Bill, what is it? Bill Lee, is that it? That's your uh, um, GitHub username? Yeah, that's, uh, uh, I think there is a 77 uh, on the back as well. Let me just double check. Yes. Okay, Bill Lee uh, 77? Yeah, Bill Lee 77. There is a 77. Uh, okay. okay, so we're going to do this then. Um, so we're using author fields to assign people who are responsible for that file. So by doing this, I'm actually going to make Bill responsible for the pre-shower. Um, I'm gonna look at the status. There's one modification here. I'm going to do git commit that file. I, uh, I was going to type minus V here, um, which I like as an option to git commit because it shows you the changes you've just made and it allows you to double check that you're not committing something that you don't actually want to commit. Um, and then I'm going to type here, um, added bill the S as responsible for B0 pre-shower. I'm going to save this and I'm going to push this to the repository which, there we go. I don't think this, does this still work in uh, in GitHub nowadays? Yeah, this probably won't uh, yeah. work. work. Okay, Get, as of last year, right, right, right. Um, Git remote, uh, um, set URL, um, origin, Git at github.com. Sorry, people. This is um, this is sort of 
GitHub internal stuff that we should not have to worry about. But now we're going to push that to the repository. OK, there we go. You actually saw in the background here that the GitHub page changed. And it says there's new changes. So we can immediately turn this now into a pull request. I'm going to say compare and pull request. And there we go. We've got a pull request created from this change. Um, I'm going to tweak this a little bit. Um, I'm going to write, you know, what does this pull request do? Um, Bill, Bill Lee, add Bill Lee will be. Hey guys, you're not very responsible. Bill be responsible for the B0 pre shower implementation. So does this, oh, this is a, a fix of a new feature. Um, and it's actually feature 91, but it's 91 on the Epic repository. Um, so I'm just going to make sure that that's, that's clear here. Um, it's in some sense a documentation update, so I'm going to check that box too. Um, no checks needed, um, no documentation changes. Well, I've communicated it with Bill, so I think we're good. Um, there's no breaking changes and there's no changes in the default behavior. I'm going to create that pull request. So again, two step process, first file an issue, create a branch, do the work, and then um, uh, use a pull request. So the two step issue with the four steps. Um, so now Bill can go in and can look at the changes I made and can start commenting on them. Say, for example, he might say, well, actually, it should be Alex. Um, and he can add that comment. Alex will get notified too then. Alex might respond, no, it shouldn't be me. This is allowing us to do this kind of collaborative work, putting the discussions on GitHub um, where the code is rather than you know over email. Um, there's even things like this um, where, where um, well, let me just not do that, where, for example, Alex might say, well, I'm actually going to make this a suggestion um, and I want to replace this with, oops, Yen. So I can suggest changes to the code right inside the GitHub environment. And if I think that this is a good change, I can commit it immediately from the GitHub environment. So now we've got a change to the code right there. And now Alex is going to be responsible for this, uh, this pull request. Um, so that's sort of the process that we are going to use in terms of collaborative work um, on these repositories for geometry, as I showed here, but also for reconstruction, also for um, any number of things uh, that are related to, uh, um, to to anything that we track source code for in um, in GitHub. Let me show one more thing. So I, I pointed out those checks that it's doing before, right? So it's it's starting these checks here, um, and it's actually uh, it's going to it should fail on one of them, I think. No, actually, it shouldn't fail anymore because we fixed that bug in DD for HEP. Um, so it actually is going to succeed um, because there's been no no meaningful changes to the to the geometry. I didn't introduce any overlaps, um, and because it will succeed in all the checks, ultimately it will be able to be merged. Now, of course, we're gonna, we're not going to do that. This is a demonstration here. Uh, may I ask one thing here? This in the detail. So how do you commit, how do you git allows to run your code? What is it the C++ compiler you put there or something? What is the exact logic behind it? So if we look at this, so I can go and look at those checks. I'm going to go to the tab here for all those checks. It, it will run checks. One against the LCG software release from CERN. 
um, and then one against EIC shell. So if I look at EIC shell, this is this is what it will do. It will run this test in EIC shell. It will run this in EIC shell. It will build the software in exactly the same way as as what we were just using on um, on the command line. This is the same EIC shell that it's using there. Same versions, same CMake, same GCC, everything the same. It will do overlap checks. It will do you know some exports of geometry. Um, it will create pictures. Um, so all of that happens in on GitHub, but using the same EIC shell with the same versions of the software with all exact same same bits. Uh, what my question is that who who installed the giant for here? Because to run the giant for you need to have a library that the JIT. Who is somebody installed everything there? And the um, it's installed in the container in the EIC shell container. So whatever is in EIC shell is available on GitHub. Oh, okay. That's that's one of the big benefits of using the standard environment, right? That you can benefit from having all these automated checks run in exactly the same environment that you're running your own development code in. Um, you do your development on your computer. If it passes, if it compiles there, you can be fairly confident it's gonna be compiling here as well because it's in the same environment. No, my question is that, uh, how did it recognize CMake? How does it recognize the Gian for classes? Is it installed on the JIT? Do we have some concern to install there? Like uh, for example, CMake, I, how it recognizes CMake, Git? Because it's inside the container. So, I mean, we could go into the details of how this, how this is working exactly, but that gets, gets deep in the weeds of continuous integration in GitHub. Which, which I think would not be interested to 32 people in the audience here. Um, okay, okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, any other questions about this sort of general approach to collaborative development? I know I had to go a little bit quick on that last bit. I think we're technically um, at the end of the tutorial, right? Um, or do we have another hour? I guess, let's see. We have technically till till another half hour, so so we can actually um, we can do some of uh, some more question and answer for the last half hour. Um, so can we create checks on GitHub? Um, yes, you can create checks on GitHub. Um, it's it's a little bit more of a of a technical um, technical issue, but. Um, for example, I can show you how this goes. Most of this goes into this .github directory and under workflows. And you see here, the second one is all of the stuff that runs in EIC shell. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of boilerplate that comes into this, but you'll see things that are very recognizable. CMake, CMake, you'll see things like if you're familiar with DD4 HEP and, and so on, you might recognize DD4, DD Web Display, which is actually not the D, which is one of the Athena tools. Um, we've got NPDET info, stuff that that is that we can use in tests. So um, these tests on GitHub are quick tests. They cannot take hours to run. GitHub does not allow us to run a full simulation there. Um, if we go to the epic repository and look at the tests that are run there for example on the, on, on matt's branch um seven hours ago we can look at the tests that are run there first of all there's there's more of them here um actually these are multiple jobs and these are also multiple jobs so if I zoom out, let me see, I can't even like get them all on the same screen here. Um, so there's about 50 different jobs that all are run. That's about the maximum we can get to with, um, with GitHub. One of the jobs that happens here is it actually triggers jobs on, um, uh, on EIC web at Argonne National Lab. So this is the part that um, 
will fail if you submit jobs from um, uh, from a forked repository because you won't have the permissions to run um, these uh, these um, checks on a on a forked repository. Now, in fact, this is probably what happened here exactly. Um, but if this succeeds, it starts about I don't know two two hours of additional checks on um, on on uh, the EIC web server at Argon, which then involve you know DIS simulations, exclusive simulations, some spectroscopy simulations, um, detailed studies of the tracking performance, detailed studies of the PID, well not quite um, of the colorimeter performance. Um, so all of that is included there. Um, those are not things we can run on on GitHub. So it depends a little bit on what additional checks you want to run on GitHub, but we can certainly run quick, small checks on GitHub, and we can run large, big checks um, at EIC Web, and that's going to be actually the topic of the last tutorial um, session that we have scheduled for now, um, and that's going to be on this uh, physics and detector benchmarking. Does that explain things uh, to sufficient detail? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Walter, you went through uh, uh, the part uh, quickly, but I wonder if you can go back to the ESU and then how you created the branch uh, from uh, from the ESU. I, I missed that part. Sure. So let's see. Um, this one, right? That was your um, issue. Yeah. So there's. And let me actually pick another one, right? So, um, because we already created a branch here. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna pick the other one from Kong here. So on the side, on the right side here, there's development where it says create a branch. So that's the way I created that branch. Now you can create the branch however you want. And then, for example, you can, you can connect it later with some other pull request. You can connect it later with another branch um so 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 there's other ways to do this but uh, but i used the, the create a branch function because it then names the branch after the issue and that makes the name of the branch clearly connected to the issue and is, yeah. is so, this so branch yeah. first, oh, oh, go ahead sorry no go ahead bill you go first yeah I, I was just wondering so if you create a branch in the other repository then you will be able to link or reference to it. Uh, that, is that what you're saying, Walter? No, yeah, so this was a little bit. So your case was a little bit of a of a special case because it actually referred to um, an, an issue that that should have gone or, or that might have gone to a, a different repository as well. Um, there's ways in which we can deal with that as well. We can, you know, if I now went back to your issue, where is it? Here it is. Um, we can actually transfer this so you know no harm done if you submit it to the wrong repository i can actually move this over to where is ip6 ip6 so so i can move this over to ip6 um but as you can see there there's there's more of a warning associated here that breaks some of the connections that we've already made potentially um so so that's typically not necessarily something we would want to do if if it's not 100% necessary and especially for for example ip6 and the epic geometry description i mean we don't really bother about moving the issues back and forth um, it would be different if for example an issue was submitted against uh, the epic repository that was that was about analysis code or so then then we would move it over so. Is that is that a good uh, good answer? Yeah, thanks, Walter. Okay, there was another question, right? Yeah, I oh. think the event is next. Yeah, I I was just gonna ask once you approve a pull request, is that branch deleted automatically? Um, no, we leave it up to the. I think right now the settings are that we leave it up to um the the owner of the branch, so it doesn't get deleted automatically. Okay. Um, it's a. Uh, you know, there's different ways in which to set up uh, GitHub repository organization. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to delete it automatically, but um, then everyone has to know that that is what is going to happen. Um, 
and I don't, and we're in a, a community where where often people are continuing to develop then on that same branch intentionally or not, um, and and that only leads to <laughs> further issues later. So. Uh, we can manually commit also these uh, if sometimes I, I personally manually commit uh, when I commit uh, in the another repository because sometimes command doesn't work it's because of password these all things new policies uh, uh, um it depends what you mean with manually commit so you cannot you cannot merge any changes into the main branch of of any of the repositories any of the repositories that that matter quote unquote um because we want to avoid getting any code in here that doesn't pass the checks so Maybe. anything that makes it into the main branch by definition has gone through um a uh um, a, a stage where it has gone through checks and it has been reviewed by one person at least one other person than whoever submitted the pull request um, and and it it has passed that both of those things. Uh, in our development direct in our development repository, we can commit manually like uploading files. Then we can make the pull request uh, something. Yeah, like you that. can. Yeah, I, I would hesitate uploading files. You know, upload files is typically not necessarily the best way. But thank you. There's um, there's other ways in which you can be productive with um, GitHub. Uh, one of the the kind of interesting ways that I, I have not really gotten into that yet is is if you just press the the period the dot point button, um, then you end up in a in a fully featured development environment, um, which you can use to compile to to write your code. Um, and and then you know edit and, and and do all of that stuff um that's quite nice um in some cases so i can go to the source files and then it will open the source files and it will do some you know yeah it always bothers me about doing things but um it has uh, syntax highlighting and so on the one thing it doesn't do is compile things so you can't actually test what you're doing um which is something that would be nice to fix, but we're not we're not at the point where we can fix it. I also haven't figured out yet how to conveniently get back to the regular GitHub from here. So, uh, uh, how, how do you reach there? Can you repeat again? Because just yeah. press the uh, dot button, just the uh, period. So. Yeah, you got it. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, um, I will take the notes I have. I will turn them into web page like format so people can can follow this offline as well. Um, and they'll be linked against the uh, um the Indigo page for for this meeting. And and tomorrow there's another session. It's going to be the same content, so don't necessarily uh feel like you have to attend both of the both tomorrow as well because you're going to see the same stuff um and please feel free to continue to send questions on the Mattermost help desk channel because you know again if we don't necessarily find out about issues that you might have or things that don't work for you even if it's a workflow issue then um we, we have a hard time being able to fix it so Okay, and I'm going to stop the recording.